Hi class. In this module, I'll be talking about conducting literature reviews, and I'll also give a quick overview of APA format. Hopefully for most of you at this point in your career, uh, this is a little bit of an overview, but I recognize that people come from all different backgrounds and levels of experience with these. So I do want to go over some of these concepts and strategies to talk about reviewing the literature. We'll talk more in our last weekend of class about writing an introduction. Your book gives a nice overview of how to think about synthesizing literature um, and the, the storytelling aspect of writing an introduction, which is one that I'll talk more about uh, in our last weekend of class. The Creswell chapter also gives a little bit of um, a sense of some of that storytelling aspect and talks about a strategy that he recommends called literature mapping that may or may not be useful to you. Um, that's not something I have done traditionally, but I think uh, it can be useful depending on how familiar you are with the topic uh, and where you are in your research career. So I'll talk first about conducting literature reviews. Um, I'll go over a few of the concepts in your book and I'll talk a little bit more in depth about Google Scholar and I'll show you an example of EndNote um, and how I have used EndNote in the past. Um, so we conduct literature reviews and review the literature more generally for a lot of reasons. Uh, the first is obviously to inform your research, to develop a research question and to inform the design um, of your research and the research methods that you'll use. and uh, that's often the first step. So we typically go into a literature review with a topic, um, maybe some sense of a question or some association that we want to look at. Um, but uh, the, the refinement of that question, if you already have one in mind, or the development of a question if you're coming with just a topic, should really very much be based in the literature. It's likely going to be based in your personal experiences and in your um, in your professional practice, whether that be education or therapy or, or advocacy or some other um, practice. Uh, but the, the final question should very much be grounded in the literature, um, and you'll use that literature to present that final question to your reading audience, um, whether that's your dissertation committee um, or the audience of a journal, a conference, etc. So uh, the, the informing of research is, is one of the primary reasons that we review literature. And your book in the, um, in the chapter on reviewing the literature, uh, I think it says, you know, you've, you've identified your research question and now you'll review the literature. And I think that's a little bit of a, of a flip-flop in some ways. Um, I, I think maybe he means, I hope that he means that, uh, that you'll review the literature, um, that you'll present your reviewed literature after you develop your research question. So the, the first step should really be conducting literature review to inform that question. And then we review literature to be able to synthesize it, to establish a problem or need for research, to put the research question into the context of existing literature so that we can compare and contrast, uh, indicate how that existing literature has led to our research question um, and how the research question makes sense in light of that. Um, sometimes the standalone literature reviews will provide a critical synthesis of that literature for other scholars, um, whether that's narrative or systematic, as your book talks about the distinction between those. Um, and for many of you moving forward in your careers in particular, it will be to inform your practice. So you have a, a difficult case, you're approaching um, a particular kind of training, and you want to be able to get a sense of what we know and how that should inform what you teach, how you treat that patient, um, things like that. So uh, these these reasons are not standalone. They are very much overlapping um, and will depend uh, from sort of instance to instance of why you're using the literature and why you're reviewing it. Standalone literature reviews, I think, are really um, can be great ways for students in particular to think about getting publications. For those of you who will be starting on your dissertations in the near future, um, you'll write a very thorough literature review in the process of doing your dissertation proposal. Um, and I've seen uh, people turn those sort of standalone literature reviews um, or turn those sections of their dissertation into standalone literature reviews that then get published. Um, this is really great. It gives you an opportunity for a sole authored publication where you're the only author. Um, it helps you establish your name in a particular field, um, and they don't require all of the resources that are underlying um, the actual conduct of research. So they're great ways to get publications. Um, and these typically need to establish the context, tell your reader why that 
is important, why we should care, um, and provide a really uh, complex and concise overview of that literature um, with some boundaries. And you want to give your reader a take-home message. What are the things that we know? Um, I often say when we're when we're critic when we're critiquing the literature, we should be careful in that. So obviously, every research has its flaws. Um, and uh, there are things that we would do differently or we think might be fatal flaws, uh, but we should always be sort of gentle and generous in our critiques, um, especially if they are, uh, if we want to engage in that particular research community. Um, we don't want to be known as that jerk who thinks everybody else's research is terrible. <laughs> um, so always be aware that the people who conducted that research may very likely be reading your research at some point. Um, and so you'll also want to give a sense of what should we be doing next, uh, what are the questions that we still have, etc. Um, and this standalone literature format, sort of this formula for, for what goes into it, um, is a similar format in some ways as the narrative review uh, format and is typically what we'll use in most research articles. Uh, in your dissertation, you'll be able to use that literature and, and give a sense that you have a sense of the full literature, um, but be able to use that strategically to lead to your research question. So again, there's this storytelling element here. So again, hopefully this is um, this is review for many of you at this point in your academic and professional careers, but we look for research and literature in all sorts of places. So academic databases, PsycInfo, PubMed are two notable ones. Um, we may look at journal tables of content, reference list of articles, particularly review articles, systematic reviews, meta-analyses. Um, for most of us at this point, we just go to Google Scholar. Um, I know when I when Google Scholar first came out, there was a lot of uh, I heard from other researchers and scholars, you can't only rely on Google Scholar. Um, and I don't necessarily think we should solely be relying on Google Scholar, but Google Scholar pulls from a whole bunch of places. Um, and there are a lot of refinement options, plus it integrates with the most reference softwares. Um, so largely at this point, when I embark on a literature review, um, I, I generally look at uh, just Google Scholar um, and then go from there. So I'll talk a little bit about some Google Scholar tips. Um, I think most people use a fairly simplistic version of Google Scholar, and I think there's um, a lot of ways in which we can make Google Scholar uh, a little bit more powerful for us. So I'll switch over to Google Scholar and talk about um, some tips that I think uh, might be helpful. I'll actually go through and talk a little bit about searching for sexual assertiveness because that's the topic that we will be um, addressing in the survey project that we're doing for this class. Uh, I'll use that as an example. Um, so for many of us, um, myself to some degree included, um, we don't know the literature on sexual sort of that's, that's not our area, that's not uh, a construct uh, or a concept that we have traditionally um, looked at in our own work, and so we may be uh, very much starting fresh on this entire topic and trying to get a sense really broadly of what we know about it. So we may start out with the, the basic search term, sexual assertiveness, and see what we get. So we get a ton um, of results, and so how do we begin from here? Um, and so a few things that I think it's useful to note. Uh, the first thing that comes up here is this uh, sexual assertiveness scale. Um, and that is likely a really good way to, to get a sense of how many people have used this scale, uh, what are the findings of this scale typically, have other people um, adapted it, used it for different populations, things like that. Um, and one of, the, one of the great ways to go about this is to look at this cited by button. And I typically do things in, in separate tabs here, so open link in new tabs so that I can keep my place in this other tab that I'm looking in. So now we can go over here, and this is pulling the 218 articles that Google Scholar finds that have used this particular scale um, or reference that article. Um, they may not have actually used the scale, but they reference that, that um, original article that established that scale. And so we can look and see um, what kinds of articles those are, what kinds of samples they've been used in, um, the kinds of analyses that have been done, the kinds of associations that have been examined, um, so that cited by button is a is a particularly great tool if you're looking at scales, if you're looking at uh, theories, um, specific authors or sort of seminal articles in a particular area, that can be really great. 
Um, to try and narrow this a little bit though, for many of us, we don't want to search through 64,000 articles um, and we want to get a better sense of potentially what is relevant for us. Um, so Google Scholar does a couple uh, of things. One of them, we'll go back here, this is a fairly new thing. They have query suggestions to help you explore new topics. So if we go back here, um, these query suggestions down here talk about some related searches. Uh, so sexual assertiveness questionnaire um, that actually gets us to some of the scale things um, and gives us a sense of some of the literature in a kind of a quick way. So sexual assertiveness condom use, victimization, uh, self-efficacy, um, self-esteem, sexual assertiveness and esteem. This is another one of the scales, the Holbert scale. Um, the Morikoff sexual assertiveness scale is another sexual assertiveness scale. So this gives us a little bit of a, of a really quick overview of some of the, the general ways in which we have thought about and researched sexual assertiveness um, in the literature. Another great way to try and uh, get a sort of overview sense of sexual assertiveness is to type in the search term review. Um, so that may help us to get some um, review articles. So women's risk perception and sexual victimization, a review of the literature. Um, so often uh, articles will say, the title will say a review of the literature, a review and synthesis of the literature, or something like that. Um, so this may help us get a little bit of a sense of review articles. Um, if we want to try and put in uh, meta-analysis and see if there are any meta-analyses that have been examined. Uh, so this is assertiveness, but this is just assertiveness more generally and not sexual assertiveness. Um, there's just something sexual in that, the word sexual, in that um, article somewhere. Um, so some of these are totally off topic. Uh, gender differences and risk taking, um, that probably is not going to be so relevant for us. Um, and so we want to get a sense of like what's been done. Has anybody else already synthesized this literature in some way that may help us get a better sense of the literature? Um, another way that we can do this is if you know already I'm interested in sexual assertiveness and I want to see what's been done um, for women, which is probably going to be actually a huge chunk of this literature. Um, for a variety of gendered reasons. Uh, and so we may type in women, um, and that will give us some overview of uh, the research literature in that area. Um, as we noted below, we may want to say something like condoms or something like that and get um, a sense of that. And we can type this in. We can also use these operators and do and condoms. Um, if we're not interested in a condoms at all. We can say not condoms and that will probably limit uh, our search to some degree. Um, although this first one is why I call this women not using condoms. <laughs> um, and uh, so we can try and limit our, our research in some ways like that. We can also do um, ranges. So if we only want to get things from uh, 20, 2000 to 2016, we can narrow that literature even more. Um, and if we know that we're going to be interested in a particular topic, um, so sexual assertiveness, for example, we can also create an alert for us such that Google Scholar will send us emails um, and we can just say anything something is published on sexual assertiveness, I want you to send me an email um, so that I can get the sort of most up-to-date literature on this topic and stay up-to-date on that. Um, that's also possible from the journal table of contents as well. Your book mentions this in one of the, I think it's one of the research and focus uh, sections. Um, you can go to most uh, journals and set up an alert. So archives of sexual behavior, journal of sex research, etc. You can set up an alert such that every time a new issue comes out, it will send you an email with the table of contents. And then you can skim through that and make sure you snag any articles that are um, that are relevant or interesting. Uh, to you and to your work. Um, so those are some things I think about Google Scholar. One of the other things that I think uh, is an interesting feature of Google Scholar is um, its integration with some of the um, the reference manager softwares. Um, so for example, we see down here, this um, goes with RefWorks, this goes with EndNote. Uh, there's also a Zotero plugin. So I have Zotero up here. Um, and so you can dump things into your Zotero folder. Um, and so you can save to Zotero using Google Scholar. 
uh, save it in a variety of ways. Um, and so that will make it so that it puts that directly into your library, um, which is really great. So if you go here and say, I want this to go into EndNote, um, this actually, I have it set up to automatically go into my Zotero, but I don't want it to do that. Um, so if I say I want this to automatically go into my EndNote, um, then it will pop over here to EndNote. It will put this in there. Um, typically with Google Scholar, and there might be a setting that you can fix this on, but it doesn't give the abstract. So if I um, do this kind of a search, I'll often, or this kind of a, a dump from, um, from this over into EndNote, I'll typically click on it and then copy and paste that abstract over into um, EndNote myself, or I'll go to the article if there is a full text article link on there um, and provide a link to that so that I can see um, that full text link in there. Um, so I will um, often do that because I keep everything um, in my EndNote library, um, and I'll show you a little bit more about EndNote uh, in a little bit. Um, I think those are sort of the main things that I uh, will show you um, around Google Scholar uh, in sort of the most useful ways that I think you can you can tailor the searches a little bit and uh, use Google Scholar to keep up to date um, on the literature. So um, when we're doing these searches, what are we looking for? Uh, so as I mentioned before, review articles, meta-analyses, uh, those can do some of the legwork for you um, when you're starting a literature review, uh, particularly in a topic that you may not know much about already. These are great ways to get a sense of what's already been done according to some other authors in terms of how they've synthesized that. Obviously, empirical articles on your topic or related topics, uh, articles that have cited key articles or have been cited by your key articles uh, that you've identified in reference lists. Theoretical articles um, are overviews of bodies of research and knowledge to define a concept. Uh, sometimes they'll give a sense of the evolution or development of that theory or concept, uh, sometimes a critique of an existing concept to try and redefine it. Um, these sometimes emphasize methodologies, but uh, typically organize findings of previous research to make very specific arguments. Um, when they're developing a new theory, for example, providing an overview of a theory, um, these can be really great ways to also get a sense of a literature. Um, and for many of you, you may be looking for uh, particularly as you're establishing the particular problem that you're interested in, you may look for large surveys or data sources like CDC, National Survey of Drug Use and Health, or NISDA. Um, SAMHSA uh, does a, a variety of surveys and provides some data, so we may also be looking for those sorts of things as well. Um, those typically won't be captured necessarily in Google Scholar searches. Uh, the latter, the surveys or data sources, we just have to um, to get a sense of where people are publishing from and are they using uh, these data sets and, and going back to those data sets. So a quick word of warning on internet searches. Um, I find that students often try and use dictionaries or encyclopedias uh, for basic definitions. Um, that's okay. Uh, those dictionaries and encyclopedias can be okay for those basic definitions, but really not for not much else. So um, don't cite Wikipedia. Um, don't cite the Oxford English Dictionary, particularly if you're saying, uh, if you're describing a, a construct or a concept that you're particularly interested in. We want to get those definitions typically from the existing research literature and not from an encyclopedia or from a dictionary. Um, a lot of internet sites serve, as, uh, serve a commercial or a persuasive purpose, so we always have to be careful of what sites we're looking at uh, and get a sense of their underlying um, sort of purpose. Um, and I often recommend uh, not so much for um, journal articles, but uh, for other kinds of internet sites, downloading and saving that material. Sites may be dynamic, and so you might not find that data a second time. Uh, I also find some of the um, some of the large uh, survey and national database kinds of websites to be challenging for me uh, to navigate. Uh, they tend to run in circles. Maybe that's just how I use them. Um, so I often will, will download in that information because I tend to struggle to sort of find it again or, or get on that same path uh, that I was on. Um, so just a few tips on, on sort of managing that. Um, many of you probably already know about Boolean searching to help you carry out better searches. Uh, so these are these Boolean operators of and, or, or not, or using the parentheses. 
Your book talks a little bit about wildcard symbols, uh, so using adherin uh, and then an asterisk to get adherence, adherent, um, behavior to get both the American English and the British English spelling of behavior, um, women and women, woman, um, will help you get both of those terms. And so, for example, if you're looking for um, sex and drugs among gay men, um, so you may say gay or MSM or men who have sex with men to give a sense that any of those search terms is fine. Often articles will use multiples of those, particularly MSM or men who have sex with men. Um, I probably would just limit that to gay or MSM. Um, and HIV or human immunodeficiency virus, most of them are just going to say HIV. This is just an example for you. Um, this one may be used differently in each of the articles, drug or substance or addiction or abuse, uh, and you may not be interested in all of those, but that may give you a really broad range of articles. Um, but you may also want to indicate that you're not interested in medication or in adherence. Um, if you put in a drug, a lot of what you may get is HIV drug medication adherence, uh, and so you may actually want to say those are the things that I don't want, actually. And as you read the literature, start jotting down alternative and relevant terms. Uh, as I mentioned, Google is now doing the, the query suggestions, so it will suggest other terms for you um, and searches for you. And so you'll get a sense of keywords used in abstract, varied spellings, uh, topics that might be related but not exactly uh, what you're interested in that may help give you a, a better sense of the literature and how it fits into the broader context of this literature um, or of literature more generally. When you're looking at empirical articles, uh, typically we read the abstract first. That gives us a sense of if that article might be relevant at all uh, to what we're interested in, if it's one we want to snag and, and put on our list to read. In the introduction, we're often looking to find additional literature to get a sense of other authors' justifications or rationale for research questions or specific research decisions, to find their evaluation of theories, models, etc., um, and what theories they use. And I think uh, particularly as students, we should always be paying attention to um, how they present those research questions and, and sort of taking note of the rationale that they use um, and how they lay that out because that will help you to become a better writer in thinking about how to do this kind of academic writing. And the methods, obviously, we're finding methodological details. Um, the thing that I'll say about results, obviously we're using these to get the specific findings. Um, I think students in particular um, and lots of scholars uh, get a little anxious about the statistics, so I don't understand what they're doing. I don't understand this complex hierarchical linear modeling, and so like I'm lost. I don't understand this. Um, and I would just say don't get too hung up on the statistics. Get the take-home message and try and get the best sense that you can of, of how they came to those specific findings. And then in the discussion, you're really getting a sense of what conclusions they're making from those findings and what are the implications of those particular findings. Particularly for students, the discussion is a great place to get ideas for future research, to generate your own research questions. Uh, most discussions will have a section of suggestions for future research, and so this is a, a place where we can get really great ideas for research. And uh, as you go through, note other articles that might be relevant to you or interesting, um, and make sure that you're pulling those as well. I think students struggle a lot to move from an article to a literature review um, of whatever kind. And I think annotated bibliographies and using reference software for this purpose can be really helpful. So creating a summary of each of your sources um, where you summarize or paraphrase the main points that are relevant for you. Um, note the sample characteristics. Uh, make sure these are in your own words. These are a great way to try and pull farther and farther away from uh, the author's original words to try and avoid plagiarizing. Um, these may include a notation, notation for yourself of how you'll use this information, uh, what you want to take from this. Um, this is something I do in my EndNote library. I'll often put in some of the keyword areas. Um, things that I want to note from that or, or projects that it's relevant to um, and that's not something I would necessarily uh, have if that I could search through the abstract. Um, you can compare or contrast the articles to others like it, uh, author information if you think it's relevant, um, and so I'll show you a little example of how you can use this in, in EndNote or reference software. So I showed you EndNote a little bit already. 
Um, EndNote can be used as a standalone to search the literature. Uh, it can be integrated with Google Scholar and with most of the other search engines, PsycInfo, PsycArticles, PubMed, etc. Um, it can help you to organize your literature using groups, uh, using keywords to be able to search. One of the best things I think it does is helps you organize um, your actual PDFs, uh, your articles. Um, and one of the really amazing, by far, <laughs> best things that it does is the Cite While You Write function that will build your bibliography or your reference list for you as you write. Um, we have RefWorks available through Widener. I haven't used RefWorks before, so I can't say a whole lot about how good it is in comparison to others. Um, EndNote costs money unless you have access somehow. Uh, that's what I had access through through my last institution, so that's what I still use because that's what everything is in. Um, Zotero is actually free anywhere. It integrates in with Google Scholar um, and is, is very internet friendly in a lot of ways. Um, I have tried Zotero a little bit and thought about moving to it. Um, I have a couple of students uh, back in New York who recommend it and, and say that they really like it a lot. Um, I can't say much about it because it's not one that I've used a whole lot. Um, but uh, just flipping back quickly to EndNote to give you a sense of, of how I have used EndNote. Um, there are all sorts of ways in which you can use this to organize by year, author, title, to do searches. For example, let's say um, I want to look at uh, sexual assault, or assault articles. Um, so this yields 71 that are already in my library um, on this topic. And so I can flip through them. I can organize them according to year. Um, I can include other search terms in there and try and narrow this a little bit. Um, if I... Uh, want to put these into a group somehow. Um, I can uh, use these particular references um, and I can create a group so I can create a group or a smart group and let's say maybe I want to create a group called assault um, and if I then can go to these search results and I can dump everything into that assault group. I can also create a smart group um, and this smart group I can say if in any field um, there is the word assault, you automatically put that into a smart group. Um, and so it'll create that smart group and as you pull new articles in here um, and search for these new articles, it will create that group for you. Um, and so it pulls those in there and then I would just name that assault smart group. And then as I pull new articles in, it'll automatically put those articles into the SMART group um, if they are, in fact, uh, have that word in, in anywhere in any of them. Another really fantastic piece is the Cite While You Write function. So let's say I were in a Word document uh, and I would say um, research uh, indicates that sexual assault uh, has a variety of negative consequences in people's lives. Um, and I would want to cite that maybe more broadly and throw a bunch of articles in there. Um, maybe I want to highlight that out, including, um, including later revictimization. And then I could come back over here. Um, I'm not going to actually pull and, and find these, although I could say um, maybe re-victimization. Um, all right, and so all of these articles indicate, let's just say I've looked at all of them and, and they all do indicate uh, that sexual assault is associated with later re-victimization. Um, then I can go here and insert my selected citations um, and then it will put all of those in there and create a bibliography for me. Um, and so now I already have my reference list started down here. Um, and within EndNote, uh, you can um, configure your bibliography. There's a whole bunch of different options for how you want to do it. Right now I have a particular style happening here because of the last article that I was working on. But let's say I want to make sure everything is in APA 6th edition. So I go over here um, and now it's largely in APA. Um, I will say with all of these softwares, it's dependent on what you actually have in your library. So um, right now, all of these citations are, uh, it looks like they're correctly cited um, according to what they are. But then if you go down here into your reference list, 
So if you look here, this is the shortened version, um, often in the AMA, American Medical Association uh, abbreviation or style of doing it. But that's because that's the only thing that I have in um, my library. So that's the um, this article right here. And so if I go into this article, um, I can see here that that's the only title that I have. Um, and that's often what Google Scholar uh, downloads for you, or maybe um, particularly what PubMed downloads for you. Um, so here I want to maybe change this to the full one. Um, and then I can uh, close that out and that will save. Um, you'll see over here that this has uh, saved in fact and that new title is in there. Um, and you'll see over here all the information about that particular uh, article, all these keywords. This is what was pulled directly probably from Google Scholar or from PubMed. Um, I actually have filed this uh, PDF in here, so that uh, PDF is included in there, as is the URL to go to that, um, that publication in PubMed. Um, so I have a ton of information in here. So if I come back over to here, um, it's still in this way, but I can go to EndNote um, and do Update Citations and Bibliography. And so now we see that that's actually updated in that full journal title is in there. Um, so if you know that you're going to be using APA format uh, primarily, I would recommend changing, and I just go through as I uh, do APA formatted things, I change these, um, or sometimes I will unlink the, the EndNote references. Um, the downside about using EndNote in some ways is if I were to do this um, in here, Journal of American College Health um, and then I would say, typically this would update if I would save it, but if I would say update everything, um, instead of keeping that, it will change that back to what it is in EndNote. Um, so uh, the, the reference softwares can make things really amazing and faster for you, um, but there are some, some ways in which you have to learn how to work with it. So uh, it is not... Um, sort of a robot that will actually create um, your reference list in exactly the way that you need it to be. But I think it's a really fantastic way to go about organizing literature, um, to creating reference lists. Uh, we used to create them at the end of a project and as a research assistant, you know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, that was often one of my main tasks was to go back through and find all the articles and type up the reference lists. Um, and that's a giant pain, and I'm glad that nobody has to do that anymore, uh, although many people still do, actually. So anyway, that's using software to manage your literature. Um, for more information about literature reviews, uh, I'll post the um, a couple of, PDF, of um, PowerPoints uh, that are on the Widener Library webpage on the research process and on using literature. Um, I'll put those in Canvas Cruiser in this module, but they're also on the library website as well. Um, so I'll end here on literature reviews. Um, for those of you who feel like you have a really good foundation in APA format, uh, don't feel like you have to watch this next part. I'll run through a fairly quick um, presentation about uh, APA format, um, and uh, that will be it for this module. So for we use APA format to standardize writing, to give appropriate credit to others, um, as I mentioned before, your book is not in APA format, and your chapter five in your book doesn't talk about APA format as one of the options uh, for formatting and for referencing. Uh, so be sure not to look at those references as, a, um, as an example for yourself. Uh, one of the, I think, more challenging things for students to learn uh, in scientific writing and academic writing more generally in an APA format is the distinction between passive and active voice. Um, this is something, for those of you who've had me in class, have probably seen me uh, talk about a lot. Uh, active voice is easier to understand. Um, in an active voice or an active voice sentence, the subject is doing the action. So, for example, an active voice example of a sentence would be the participants completed a survey, whereas in passive voice, the participants were given a survey to complete. So in the active voice version, the participants, the subject of the sentence, is actually doing whatever action is happening in the sentence. Uh, another example of active voice is researchers demonstrated an association between sexual satisfaction and relationship satisfaction. Passive voice version is it was shown that there was an association between sexual satisfaction and relationship satisfaction. 
Um, a colleague of mine recently gave me uh, this trick that I that he uses with his students and I think is a really fun little trick. Um, if you can put by zombies behind the verb of the sentence and the sentence still makes sense, then it's passive voice. So using the example above, the participants were given a survey by zombies to complete. Um, there's a whole section on the Purdue uh, OWL website, which I think is a great resource for people in addition to the APA format guide. Uh, an overview quickly of numbers. Um, so we often use numerals in APA format. We use numerals to express numbers 10 and above. Uh, there are some exceptions to that uh, in the APA format guide. Um, percentages, age, uh, scores on a scale, we typically use numerals to express. And we use words to express numbers beginning sentences, um, or we reword the sentence in a lot of cases, and numbers below 10, so 9 and below. Um, never start a sentence with a number in numerals, so it would be incorrect to say 40% of participants identified as heterosexual and to start that sentence with 4-0 uh, in APA format. Um, the correct, a couple of correct ways to do this would be to reword the sentence and say in the full sample 40% of participants identified as heterosexual, um, or to write that out and say 40% of participants identified as heterosexual. Just don't start the sentence with a number in numerals. Uh, your book talks about plagiarism. I talked about plagiarism a little uh, in the class overview. Plagiarism consists of presenting work either paraphrased or not without attributing that work to the source. Um, I think one of the things that uh, that is a common mistake uh, for people who are new to academic or scientific writing uh, is to simply put quotes around things and so their papers end up looking like a whole long string of quotes um, and so it's not enough to just put quotes around a series of sentences and to call that your own um, you can't just put a few words in between quotes and string that together as a paper um, it's also not enough to change just a few words inside that source uh, really put the findings into your own words and then credit that source. Um, in this course, if you're caught plagiarizing, you'll fail the assignment and thus likely the course. Um, when you use Turnitin to turn in assignments, uh, look at that report when you turn in assignments. This is particularly relevant for your final paper um, in this class. Uh, and there is a Turnitin plagiarism quiz that I, uh, I don't think I posted yet and I'll post in this module. Um, if you want to run through those quick questions and get a sense of how uh, how good you are at being able to, to know what is and what isn't plagiarism. Some common writing and formatting issues uh, that are both true for academic writing and uh, APA formatting issues are um, not being concise enough in writing. Um, that's a, a feedback that I probably will give to many of you to help you write in this very academic and scientific way um, and to try and be as concise as you can. Um, a couple of other common mistakes that I see in people's writing are um, not, not distinguishing correctly between affect and effect. Um, affect is typically a verb meaning to influence, um, so longitudinally, sexual satisfaction, affected, relationship satisfaction. Um, effect indicates the result of something, this is usually a noun, um, results indicated a significant effect of sexual satisfaction on relationship satisfaction. Um, semicolons versus colons. Semicolons should be used to separate two independent clauses. Uh, no capitalization is necessary in the second clause. Colons should be used to separate a complete introductory clause from a second clause that may or may not be able to stand on its own, um, but that somehow uh, works along with that first thought. Uh, if the second clause is a complete sentence on its own, the first letter should be capitalized. Um, quotation marks, make sure that you are aware of APA format uh, on block quotes. Um, and uh, a really common thing that I see is putting periods or punctuation periods and commas, semicolons, whatever, um, on the outside of closing quotation marks. Those should be on the inside of closing quotation marks. Uh, the ampersand versus and. Uh, for in-text citation, you'll use an ampersand in parenthetical citations and use and in non-parenthetical citations. So if you're talking about an article and you say um, Wells and Golub, if you're using that in the regular part of a sentence, not in a parenthetical reference, you would use the full word and. If you say researchers have found blah 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 and then uh, put the reference in parentheses, then you would use the ampersand. Um, another thing that I, that I see in a lot of uh, student writing is 
unclear comparisons. So making sure that you're being clear about your comparisons. So men scored higher in sexual satisfaction. Um, that may be clear from the rest of the context, uh, but make sure that it's clear. Um, otherwise, make that comparison very clear. So do you mean higher in sexual satisfaction than in sexual anxiety, than women? Um, so if that comparison is not clear from the context, uh, from the surrounding sentences, make sure it is clear in that particular sentence. When you start a sentence with this, make sure the referent is clear or add that referent to the sentence. Uh, so sometimes students will have a, a full paragraph of information and say, this illustrates uh, the basic concept of whatever. Um, and it may be clear from, from the writing what the this is, um, but if it's not, make sure that it is. So there are a lot of references you can use, APA Publication Manual, the Owl Purdue website. Um, I'll uh, pay special attention in your writing to APA format, um, probably more than people have so far, uh, perhaps in the program. And so make sure that you're paying close attention to details. Um, so for example, if you were looking at this following uh, citation list um, and trying to identify which of the following citations is correctly in APA format, you'll see that these look very similar um, to one another. And so you'll have to pay very close attention to the details on this. So maybe pause right now and see if you can identify which of these is correctly in APA format. And then we'll move forward. So this is the one that's correctly in APA format. And so for the rest of these, um, I'll point out some of the errors here. So for this one, um, the title is all in capital letters. Um, and so if you see here, the correct one has the first word in, uh, is capitalized and the rest of the words are not capitalized. Um, otherwise this one is correct. Um, in this one, uh, the journal title is not uh, in italics, nor is the volume uh, in italics. So that needs to be in italics. Um, for this one, we see that the journal title is in italics, but it's not capitalized. So all of the words, um, except for of and, and smaller operator words, uh, need to be capitalized in the journal title. Um, otherwise, this one is actually correct. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of details um, to attend to when you're using APA formatting in references. And I will be paying close attention to those details, so make sure that you do as well. All right, if you have questions or thoughts, post those under the general discussion forum. Um, we will also spend some time in our first weekend in class sort of running through a lot of this content and uh, so that I can answer any questions. You know, it's hard to sometimes watch these uh, and not be able to stop me if something I say doesn't make sense uh, or if you have questions about something. So we'll spend some time on our first day of class running through these and helping us all to make sure we're on the same page. All right, thanks.